Hey everybody, welcome to our video on subduction zones, the birth and death of lithosphere. So you probably know that subduction zones are where oceanic lithosphere dives down beneath another piece of lithosphere, causing melting and associated volcanism. But have you ever thought about why subduction zones are so important in the larger picture of plate tectonics? There's so many reasons. For one, this is where lithosphere gets recycled back into the mantle. So anybody who cares about the mantle or big scale processes cares a lot about what happens at subduction zones. Likewise, most tectonicists think that slab pull or the density of the sinking slab is one of the major driving forces of plate tectonics. So again, it's that disappearance of the slab at the subduction zone that exerts forces on all of the other plates. Perhaps most importantly, subduction zones are where continent-continent collisions occur. Things like the Himalayas are built. This is how continental crust gets built. Every one of you is sitting on a continent that was probably formed by a continent-continent collision that took place at a subduction zone. So it's pretty important to understand how that works. And finally, these subduction zones are the site of a lot of global volcanism. That volcanism is what builds continental crust. It also kills people and animals and is a huge factor in the global carbon cycle and the atmospheric chemistry in general. So subduction zones touch a lot of pieces of earth science. And in this video, we're gonna to try to understand some of the basic ideas. And I wanna frame this video with a comparison between two different subduction zone volcanoes. One is the Torashima volcano, sitting above the Izu Bonin arc, just south of Japan. The other is the Sinabong volcano, sitting on the northern part of the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. These are both andesitic stratovolcanoes, but they're very different. One is at sea level, it's only 185 kilometers from the trench, and the trench itself is incredibly deep, 31,000 feet. In contrast, Cinnabong sits much higher above land, 2,500 meters. It's a full 300 kilometers from its trench, and the trench is much shallower, 16,000 feet deep. So just these basic observations between these two volcanoes at two different subduction zones begs a lot of questions. Why is the physiography so different? And what's that telling us about the processes that are at play? So in this video, we're gonna start with a quick overview of the anatomy of subduction zones. Then we'll look at what controls the dip of subducting slabs. We'll talk a bit about what controls melting and volcanism at subduction zones. And then we'll close with a summary where we'll try to categorize subduction zones in terms of two end members, either a steeply dipping Mariana end member or a shallow dipping Andean end member. So here we go. One of the most basic ways to categorize subduction zones is as either an island arc or a continental arc. And the key difference here, they both involve oceanic lithosphere being subducted, but in the island arc case, oceanic goes down beneath another oceanic slab plate. And in the continental case, the oceanic goes down beneath a continental lithosphere. So as you might have guessed, this is pretty much the case with Torashima in the Izubonian arc. And this is pretty much the case with the Cinnabong volcano on the Sumatran arc. So let's look at that. Here's Torashima, essentially a volcano sitting within the Philippine Sea Plate, which is mostly oceanic lithosphere. And here is Cinnabong, sitting on the Sunda Plate, which is mostly continental lithosphere. So, so Cinnabong is a continental arc. Torashima is part of an oceanic arc. So now let's look at a simplified and idealized anatomy of a continental arc. So this is something like what the Sumatran subduction zone looks like. So the first feature is called the oceanic trench. And this is a, a deep area created by the flexure 
and the down warping of the downgoing slab. Where it starts to dip away, we essentially create a little depression here, um, and that is the oceanic trench. And that sits just outboard from what we call the accretionary wedge. This is basically a pile of unconsolidated sediments that have been scraped off the downgoing slab and thrust onto each other into what we might call a chaotic melange. And although this is mostly loose sediment, we can occasionally get blocks of solidified limestone or even of oceanic basalt within this accretionary wedge. Moving a bit further inland, we've got the four arc basin, which sits between the accretionary wedge and the volcanic arc. And of course, this volcanic arc is where magmatism is coming up from melting above the slab and making its way up to erupt at the surface above the slab. And we'll talk more about that later. Finally, some subduction zones have what's called a back arc basin. This is essentially an area of extension behind the arc in which this regime is actually under extension and the lithosphere is actually being thinned. And we can even actually start to establish a mid-ocean spreading ridge in some of these cases. And we're going to see at the end that this is often due to what we call trench rollback, as this slab may actually be pulling away and putting the whole regime under extension. So moving from cartoon into real world, here's a map view of the Sumatra subduction zone. And we can see a lot of those features in the physiography. So here's the trench. These islands actually are places where the accretionary wedge has popped up above the surface of the ocean. Here's the four arc basin. Here's a chain of volcanoes, which make up the volcanic arc. And in places behind Sumatra, we actually have an extinct back arc basin, which is no longer actively extending. And here's the Cinnabong volcano sitting up here on the northern end of the island. OK, so now you know some basics about the anatomy of subduction. Let's start to look at what controls variations in that anatomy. And we'll start with looking at the dip of the subducting slab. So first of all, how do we know what the dip of the slab is? We know it by locating earthquakes that are occurring within the downgoing slab and immediately adjacent to it. And in most cases, we would never get earthquakes below about you know, 15 kilometers depth in the crust. It's simply too hot and too ductile. But because the downgoing slab is so cold and rigid, we can actually get brittle earthquakes within it to very, very deep depths. And some of those are shown here in transects across the Izu Bonin arc. So Japan is up here. Here's the Izu Bonin subduction zone coming down here. And we've got four transects, A, B, C, and D. And along those transects, you can see uh, the depth of the earthquakes, which are essentially delineating the slab. And have a look at this, B to B prime. Subduction here at this part of the Izu Bonin is essentially vertical, as that old cold slab drops straight down into the mantle. Pretty amazing. And of course, the Torashima earthquake uh, volcano is sitting right up here above that slab. So that was an example of a very steep slab. And that was here along the Izu Bonin arc. But it turns out that slabs can also be very, very shallow. So this figure shows essentially a compilation of Wadati Benioff zones globally. And we see that many are very steeply dipping, but then others are very shallowly dipping. And the Sumatran slab is one of those fairly shallow dipping slabs as it dives under the Sunda plate and creates the Cinnabong volcano. So this is just to show you that we have huge variation everywhere from about 5 degrees to a full vertical 90 degrees 
of subduction angle. And so what controls that angle or that dip? The biggest thing is the density of the subducting lithosphere. Okay, If the lithosphere is denser, it's going to be able to sink more vertically and more directly down into the Earth's mantle. And that density depends on the age of the oceanic lithosphere, its temperature, and importantly, the thickness of the lithospheric mantle root. Remember that all this oceanic plates have this underplated oceanic lithosphere that is essentially cooled manic mantle material. And it's very, very dense. As that root gets thicker, that acts as an anchor to pull these older tectonic plates down into the mantle. Okay, Whereas younger lithosphere tends to still be quite warm and quite buoyant. So that's really important. Really the density, which is a function of age, temperature, and thickness. A secondary effect is also the thermal buoyancy of the displaced asthenospheric mantle. So essentially, this downgoing slab is having to displace a stenosphere out of its way. And some of that warm, hot asthenosphere actually essentially kind of flows around underneath the slab and acts as a positive buoyancy to kind of push it up. And that effect can be stronger for more rapidly subducting slabs. So just to bring this back to our two examples, here's the Torishima volcano over in the Izu Bonin arc. Keep in mind, this was an example of a very steeply dipping slab. And it makes sense. The oceanic lithosphere that's subducting here is a full 150 million years old. Okay, you can see it's greenish blue on this scale. Okay, so it's going down really densely and steeply. In contrast, if we come over to northern Sumatra, the lithosphere here is 40 or 50 million years old. So it's still warm and fairly buoyant, and it just doesn't have that density. So it's going to go down much more shallowly beneath the Cinnabong volcano. And so we also see the effects of this slab dip in the depth of the trench. So trench depth is essentially controlled by the slab dip and by the sediment load because sediment can come in and actually fill in that trench. And look at these stark differences. Across the Izu Bonin arc and to the Torashima volcano, the trench here is 31,000 feet deep, almost the deepest place on Earth. In contrast, as we come across the Sumatran subduction zone, to the Cinnabong volcano, the trench here is only 16,000 feet deep. And you really don't really go back up at all to the ocean floor. And so again, this shallower trench is to the result of younger, more buoyant lithosphere, and also perhaps filling of that trench a bit by a, a high sediment flux coming off the Himalaya, which is actually just to our north. And before we move on, I just want to hit home one other point. Notice the difference in the morphology of the accretionary wedge complexes between these two subduction zones. Here, in the Sumatran subduction zone, the accretionary prism or the accretionary wedge is so big, it's actually popping above the water surface. All of these islands are actually accretionary prisms. Okay. In contrast, in the Izubonin arc, there's really only minor or essentially no accretionary prisms. And we can also see that here. Look at this huge accretionary prism right here, where it's actually popping above sea level. And so why is that? The presence of this large accretionary prism really also has to do with the presence of a lot of sediment at a shallowly dipping slab. And so essentially, as that slab goes down, there's a, the scraping is even more intense because the, the scraper's coming in at a lower angle. And there's more sediment to be scraped. 
So the result is you get big, thick, wide accretionary prisms, which in some places have actually built themselves right up above sea level in parts of the Sumatran subduction zone. And here's an example of that. If we go to one of these islands off the coast of Sumatra, these beautiful tropical beaches, but in places, the interiors of these islands can actually be filled with exploding mud volcanoes, where literally overpressured mud from the interior of these accretionary wedges is erupting onto the surface, sometimes actually burying villages and causing damage. So here it's a direct reminder that some of these islands are accretionary wedges. OK, so now we've talked about slab dip and morphology of subduction zones. Let's move into talking about volcanism and melting, which is a really important attribute of these zones. So melts and magmas at subduction zones are generated by, by two key processes. Okay? The first is essentially dewatering of sediment in the downgoing slab that triggers melting in the overlying asthenosphere. Sometimes we'll call that the mantle wedge. Here it is. Here comes the slab going down. This orange part is the asthenospheric mantle wedge, a little wedge of mantle tucked right in here. What happens is as those sediments in that basaltic crust go down, they're carrying a huge amount of water mostly in the form of hydrated minerals. As those minerals heat up, they release water, which lowers the melting point of this mantle, this overlying mantle wedge, and causes that mantle wedge to partially melt. And we start to generate melts here. Those melts make their way up towards the surface. And as they do, this is where the second process comes in. This is melting of the overlying continental crust or continental lithosphere. As that magma makes its way up, it melts the surrounding rock a bit, which actually adds even more felsic material to it. So by the time the magma erupts from a volcano here, it's been through a lot. It's been, it was born by partial melting in the mantle wedge, but then it was altered by as it melted its way up through the continental lithosphere. So the result of these processes is what we would call an intermediate composition. The magmas and the melts and the rocks have what we call an intermediate composition. For example, many subduction zone volcanoes erupt what we call andesite. This is a rock that is generally more felsic than basalt but it's less felsic than rhyolite. In other words, it has higher silica, potassium, sodium content than basalt does, but it has a lower silica, potassium, sodium content than a rhyolite might. And here's a beautiful example of an andesite flow coming off one of the Three Sisters volcanoes above the Cascade subduction zone in Oregon. And it's worth noting that these andesite lava flows, they're very viscous, and they don't flow very far. They pretty much erupt and cool. And because of that, they tend to pile up on top of each other. And that piling of andesite lava on andesite lava eventually builds what we would call a stratovolcano. Okay? These beautiful, typical volcanoes that you're used to seeing. They're cone-shaped. They have steep sides. You can even see, perhaps, well, maybe see some lava flows along their flanks. These stratovolcanoes are the signature of subduction magmatism. And in fact, we see these all around the world wherever there's a subduction zone, most famously in what we would call the Ring of Fire. Most of the Pacific margin is essentially being subducted, kind of on all sides. And everywhere that Pacific plate is being subducted, it's generating these stratovolcanoes, the Cascades, the Aleutians, uh, Japan, 
right? South America, all these places have these stratovolcanoes. And of course, let's not forget our Torishima volcano and our Cinnabong volcano, which are both stratovolcanoes. All right, so taking this one step deeper, what actually exactly controls where the melting occurs within a subduction zone? And this is really controlled by how quickly the subducting oceanic lithosphere can heat up and start to release water from the hydrous minerals. Okay, And so this shows uh, a thermal model of a subducting slab at the Izu Bonin arc. And these are temperature contours. Here's our mantle wedge, which is very hot perhaps sitting at 1300 degrees. Here's the slab, which is as cold as a few hundred degrees, okay? So we've got cold slab against hot wedge, and things are warming up quickly. Right around here, between about 200 degrees and about 600 degrees, is where the water starts to be released by breakdown of these hydrous minerals things like lawsonite, phlogopite, and amphibole. So with a, with a more steeply dipping slab, okay, that because the dip is steeper, those hotter temperatures are essentially going to be achieved closer to the trench interface here. So with a relatively steep dipping slab, like Izubonin, we're going to have a short arc trench distance. Remember, Torashima sits only 185 kilometers from the trench because the slab goes almost straight down and we reach those, those dehydration temperatures really pretty quickly in a lateral sense. And here's a comparison with the Sumatran arc. These are different figures, but they're to roughly the same scale. And so what you can see is that if the slab's going down in a shallow sense, we're not going to reach those dehydration temperatures of, say, 200 to 500 C uh, until we are further away from the trench. So in the case of the Sumatran arc, that arc trench distance is roughly 300 kilometers, significantly more than the Izubonin because of that more shallow dip. Great. So now you've learned a lot of things, and I want to try to wrap this up and summarize it by introducing you to two end members. One end member is called the Mariana type subduction, or it could just as easily be called the Izu Bonin type. And this is essentially a steeply dipping subduction zone that has many of the properties we've been talking about with relation to the Izu Bonin in the Torashima. So we have very old, dense lithosphere, which gives us very steep subduction and a relatively deep trench. One other important feature here is it's at these steeply dipping subduction zones where we tend to get the back arc extension that I talked about early in the video. And this is due to a process called trench rollback. I won't go into detail, but essentially what happens is this slab is actually sinking so fast and so steeply that its point of curvature here, the interface, actually starts to migrate backwards. This, this, this point actually migrates to the right as it's kind of being pulled down. And so to the extent that the downgoing slab is coupled to the overriding lithosphere, that actually throws the overriding lithosphere into extension and can actually open up the back arc here. And of course, then that can be helped along by the presence of hot mantle in the wedge, possibly some volcanism seeping over here. Um, and in some cases, you can actually start spreading centers in the, in the backside of these Mariana type arcs. So here's an example of that. This is an actual cross-section of the Mariana 
not going to go into any detail on this, but it's in your notes if you'd like to take a look. But note that we do actually have back arc spreading uh, behind the Mariana arc. Okay, so the second end member is a shallowly dipping subduction, and it's called the Chilean type. Okay, and this is very analogous, perhaps in some ways, to Sumatran subduction that we talked about for Cinnabon. So we've got young, buoyant lithosphere, or perhaps lithosphere that's simply thickened by a lot of extra continental crust, or excuse me, oceanic crust, for example, seamounts. Anyway, you got buoyant lithosphere. It doesn't want to go down. This gives us a shallow trench, a shallow slab. And importantly, instead of seeing trench rollback and back arc extension, we see back arc compression. In this case, like in the Andes, because the slab is going down so shallowly, it actually pushes against the overriding plate and can actually throw the whole region into compression. This is not really happening in Sumatra, but it is certainly happening in Chile, in the Andes, where the name comes from. So here we've got the shallowly subducting Nazca slab here. And essentially, there is a lot of compression across the Andes, which has actually helped to thicken the continental lithosphere over time instead of thin it. And right now, the, the active compression is taking place actually on the eastern side of the Andes, or the backside, um, in what we call the sub-Andean belt. Uh, in this particular example, this is a fold and thrust belt, where we've got a bunch of upthrust blocks that are being piled on top of each other, some of them riding along weak detachments. And we'll talk more about that later in the course. But basically, you've got a lot of shortening and thickening on the east side of the Andes, really as a result of low angle subduction, putting the whole thing under a compressive stress. So in summary, we've learned a lot in this video. We've learned that all subduction zones have similar morphologies. They all have a trench, an accretionary wedge, a fore arc, and a volcanic arc. We learned that the dip of the subducting slab is delineated by earthquakes, and it's determined really mostly by the density of the subducting lithosphere. In general, older lithosphere is colder with a thicker root of dense lithospheric mantle, so generally older lithosphere goes down more steeply. We then showed that trench depth and the size of the accretionary prism are really also determined by the slab dip and the sediment load. We then looked at melting and volcanism. We showed that melting above a subduction zone is triggered by release of water into the overlying mantle wedge. And that occurs at temperatures of about 200 to 600 degrees as hydrous minerals are dewatered. Due to a number of processes, subduction zone magmas tend to be intermediate in composition, something like andesite, which ends up producing distinctive stratovolcanoes. We showed that the arc trench distance is really determined by how quickly laterally melting can occur, which is really determined by the slab dip and the thermal properties of the slab. So for steeply dipping subduction zones, we get a short arc trench distance. And then we summarized a lot of these ideas with the Mariana and Chilean type end members. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with these concept questions. See you in class.